welcome to our third video of IB Biology Higher Level Topic 10. Um, in this video, we are looking at 10.3 gene pools and speciation. Okay, so our first understanding that we're looking at is this whole concept of a gene pool consists of all the genes and the different types of alleles present in an interbreeding population. So if you think of that term population, which is all of a species in a certain area. OK, now we're talking interbreeding, so we're talking species. All right. The gene pool is all the genetic information there and but all the forms of the different genes, the different alleles and that. Let's look at that in a bit in a closer detail. All right, so when we think of that whole concept of that interbreeding population, we're thinking of species. So a group of organisms that can reproduce to give a fertile offspring, okay? So that's what we call our interbreeding population. Population. Now here I've just got the classification that we learn in one of our core units and just looking at the human there, just to work through the levels of classification down to the species. Now, when we're thinking about gene pools, as we said, it's this common set of genes, but thinking in allele form found within a species. It can be reproductively or geographically isolated from each other. And we will look at um, reproductive and geographic isolation later in the video. Um, due to this, we can have multiple gene pools existing for the same species and specific species. And that's how in humans we get that great variation. So then reproducing individuals add to the gene pool for the next generation. OK, because you have um, two organisms that reproduce and then create this variation in the gene pool as such. Genetic equilibrium, there's a new term. That's all of the population have an equal chance of contributing to the gene pool. So every member of a population has an equal chance to contribute to the gene pool. OK, our next understanding, evolution requires that allele frequencies change with time in populations. If there was no change to the allele frequency, so how often the alleles occur, there would be no evolution. It would be static. But as with the word frequency, we've got some maths involved in this. All right, so thinking gene or allele frequency, this is usually expressed as a percentage or a proportion, just like any frequency work that you're doing. Um, it measures how frequently an allele from a specific gene locus, sorry, a specific gene locus occurs in a population. It offers an accurate measurement of the level of genetic variation in a population. So we're really now looking at the um, numbers game as such behind the genetics and looking at how that plays a part in evolution. So a population with a large gene pool has substantial variation in its traits. A population with a small gene pool shows little variation and therefore you've got that inbreeding occurring. Okay, in a large population spread over a vast range of geographic geographical locations, there can be differences in allele frequency. So in a certain point in that ge in the geographic location, the gene frequency might be quite low, so not much variation. But in an another part, the gene frequency could be higher. So the bigger the geographical location, the more spread of gene frequencies throughout that area. It's not going to be static. Alrighty, when we're thinking of gene or allele frequency, you know, we are thinking of frequency. So bringing a bit of maths into it. When all genotypes in a population are known, we can count the number of each type of allele present. 
an allele frequency will have a value between zero and one. When the allele frequency is one, all members of the population are homozygous and show the same phenotype for that trait. All right, let's have a think about evolution and where that falls with all of this. So evolution is defined as that cumulative change in heritable characteristics of the population over time. And it requires these changes in allele frequencies within the population. As I say, if there is no change in allele frequency, there will be no evolution. It will remain static. So change in one or a few bases can generate a new allele. We've looked at that before. And evolution is a change in allele frequency. So you have a change in the allele, then you get more and more of those alleles developing, which means you've got that change of allele frequency. When I say developing, I mean um, being reproduced in more and more offspring. Okay, so this is any change in the oh, there's a nice word allelic frequencies within a gene pool from one generation to the next. That's what I just said. So the gene can involve a single gene locus or multiple loci. Alrighty, now your essential idea for this unit was that gene pools change over time. And we've already kind of looked at how that happens. Um, but to have a closer look, we really need to have a think about all those steps involved in the process of evolution. Okay, so you've got these changes in allele frequencies, which in turn cause variation. And with variation and certain selection pressures, pressures and things like that, you start to get speciations, new species forming, and in time, this leads to evolution. So for basic mechanisms of evolutionary change, there must be genetic variation in a population. The more variation there is, the higher the frequency of the alleles. Okay, so we've got three main sources of genetic variation. This is just revision. First one, gene flow, that refers to the movement of those genes from one population to another. Perfect location for a pedigree chart there. The second source of genetic variation is that sexual reproduction. Okay, so that's where we've introduced new allele combinations into the population. There's a reshuffling of the alleles during gamete formation and that crossing over and the independent assortment. Then, of course, we've also got that random fertilization after we've had that independent assortment. And then our third type of genetic variation is down to the mutations. OK, now this involves that permanent alteration to the DNA based sequence of the genome of an animal. A single mutation can have a major impact on the phen phenotype of the organism. However, in most cases, evolutionary changes can only occur following the accumulation of many mutations. All right, so we've got those changes in allele frequency and that variation. So we've really looked at that. Now we're going to have a look at the effects of selection pressures on populations. So these are environmental factors that act on various phenotypes. It has that direct effect on natural selection, can be biotic or abiotic, and it affects the organism's chance of survival and reproduction. So basically, certain um, members of the population will struggle. It's that survival of the fittest. So some individuals are selected for, whilst others are selected against. Those ones that are selected against do not reproduce. Um, organisms possessing features that are selected for will survive and pass on their genes. Those possessing then those phenotypes that have been selected against become eliminated. After a few generations, this will show up as a change in allele frequency. So selective pressures is the driving force behind both natural selection and in the long term evolution. And rem remembering these selection pressures can be biotic and abiotic. 
okay you could be thinking of things like um, temperature you could be thinking of camouflage of specific area Alrighty, so moving on from that whole concept of those selection press uh, selection pressures we've got different types of selection pressures okay three different types so we've got directional stabilizing and disruptive now just to let you know disruptive is the bottom one down there also called diversifying but in your syllabus we are calling it disruptive selection So we start off looking at this concept of stabilizing selection. And if you look at the graph there, you can see how um, we're looking at average birth weight in human babies. Okay, now the selection pressures, which are known as stabilizing, are where we get remove the extremes. Okay, so when you think of human babies, human babies that are born with a very, very low birth weight, generally have a lower chance of survival than those born with an average birth weight. Sorry, the diagram, the graph is in pounds, which is bad, but it does give us the idea. Babies born with very, very high birth weights also run a risk of not surviving. Okay, so the average birth weight by far has the best survival rate. So that is what we call a stabilizing selection pressure. So here we're looking at this whole idea of the disruptive or the diversifying um, selection pressures and these act to remove intermediate varieties favoring the extremes sometimes it is an advantage to have two different or opposing varieties of a phenotype rather than just one so here we've got some weird bird devil and in in terms of selection pressures here it's better to have a blue and a red population rather than the pink population in the middle so some examples not weird devil bird looking things um in a species of tadpole um that are omnivorous so those are omnivorous are selected against and those that are herbivorous and coniferous are selected for. So the omnivores are removed more, whereas the herbivores and carnivores are selected for. So they, they breed on as such. The middle phenotype is selected against, favoring the two extremes. Okay, and this maintains two distinct phenotypes within the population. So it's not the merging of the two, like in stabilizing. Now, directional selection pressures. Um, selection of one extreme over another. Okay, so the population changes as one extreme of a range of variations is better adapted. So we start off in our diagram with, we go, they look like, I don't know, some strange animal, I can't see. Um, we go from a light fur colour to a dark fur colour. And you see we've kind of moved in a direction up towards the dark fur colour. So we've lost that lighter end. Now, an example of this is the peppered moth that we looked at in one of the core units. OK, so you can imagine that um, during the Industrial Revolution, when you had the pollution on the trees and the dark peppered moth increased the numbers of the dark pepper moth would have increased so think of this graph being peppered moths that exact uh, movement would have happened to the right but then when the clean air act came in the pollution dropped we got more and more of the lighter color moths we would have moved back towards the left Alrighty, so a couple of different graphs here so showing the movement of the populations as such. So we've got our stabilizing, we've got our directional, and then we've got our diversifying. Now, just remembering diversifying or disruptive, just remember with the directional, that is fluid, that can move over time with the population. Again, just another representation of that now using some mice 
and you can see the outcome on the bottom. So you end up, you start off with a range of mice and then for each of our different types of selection pressure, it shows you which mice would be more common. Okay, so the whole uh, concept of speciation, which we looked at in a core unit, is the formation of a new species by the dividing of a population. So you start off with your original population and due to um, various mechanics we end up with two new species okay so your new understanding here is that reproductive isolation of populations can be temporal behavioral or geographic so we're looking at that reproductive isolation so reproductive isolation is the inability of two organisms belonging to two different species to mate and reproduce with fertile offspring. Now, that can be due to ge geographic isolation, and these are what we call allopatric speciation. Some examples of those are Darwin's finches and Grand Canyon squirrels, where you've started off with the same population, but due to geographic isolation, they have then evolved into new species. And they can't, if they were put back together, they cannot reproduce. Okay, so now we're looking at behavioural isolation or this sympatric um, speciation. Okay, so we've got some examples here, the apple maggot fly, the orca. Okay, and this kind of isolation occurs within the same geographical area. Um, if speciation occurs, then the process is termed sympatric speciation. For example, um, isolation can be behavioural, and when closely related individuals differ in, for example, their court, courtship behaviours, they are often only successful in attracting members of their own population. Okay, so if these behaviours do not attract another mate, for example, they're not going to reproduce. So it's that behavioural isolation. Also apparent in back, some bacteria. Then we have temporal isolation. Now, these again are gene pools within the same area. And what occurs here is you might have these organisms that are the same or very, very similar species, but there's something about their um, way of life as such that means they can't reproduce. So for example, with both the frogs and the crickets here, their breeding, their length, their breeding seasons, their length of um reproductive viability as such is completely different so they cannot reproduce all righty now we've talked a lot about um allele frequency and we've talked about these isolated populations now to have a look at some maths all right, so how do we calculate allele frequency? All individuals have at least two alleles of each gene. You guys know that. The total number of alleles is then twice that of the individuals in the population because every member of the population has two alleles for each gene. The allele frequency's total is one. Okay, so allele frequency, the total is one. This means that if the allele frequency of what one allele is given, the frequency of the other allele can be calculated by subtracting the known frequency for one. So if we had the frequency of allele, and we've got our dominant allele there, okay, we want to find that. We're doing one minus the frequency of the allele, the recessive allele. Or if we want to find the recessive allele, the frequency of the recessive allele, we have one minus the frequency of the dominant allele. The allele controlling the dominant trait will always be denoted as a letter P and the allele denoting the recessive trait will be 
um, given the letter Q. And if you look in the diagram there, you can see our P and our Q related to the diagrams below. Oh, look at this. This is fabulous on the right hand side here. All right. Assumptions made in Hardy in the Hardy Weinberg principle known as HW equilibrium. What assumptions are made? What is the um, Hardy Weinberg principle? Allele frequencies tend to stay constant in a population over time where random mating occurs, the population is large, all phenotypes survive equally well, and all matings produce the same numbers of viable offspring. So they state that allele frequencies tend to remain constant in those conditions. Also, where there is no migration into or out of the populations, you've got no movement. Still looking at these assumptions made. Populations that stay constant, thinking of those previous requirements, are said to be in the HW equilibrium, so the hardy Weinberg principle. The allele frequencies will tend to stay constant from generation to generation until a, an agent of change acts upon that population. So just take some time to have a look at the Hardy-Weinberg analysis next to us and you start to see those P's and Q's that we mentioned earlier in terms of population. You don't need to know this in depth, but just familiarize yourself with what you're looking at. All right, some more understandings. Speciation is due to the divergence of isolated populations. Now, this can be gradual or it can be abrupt. So the last thing we said was that the allele frequency will stay constant from a generation to generation unless there's an agent of change. We're now looking at those agents of change. So it can happen gradually or abruptly. And this is what we call the rate of evolutionary change. So gradualism, gradual evolutionary change. Changes that are small, continuous and slow. Supporters of this view, Darwin in the late 18th century, argue that the fossil record shows a succession of small changes in the phenotypes of species. This indicates that speciation is steady and ongoing as organisms make gradual changes better suiting them to their environment. Now look at this graph that we've got here, it's brilliant. You've got the physical features, you've got time and then you've got the frequency of them and you can see this slight movement of the physical features and a slight increase of the um, frequency of those features over time. Now consider two populations of the same species that are isolated in two different environments. Each one of them will change very gradually over time to adapt to their new environment. A point will be reached where the gene pool of the two populations will be so different that members of the two populations, if placed together, will be unable to breed together to produce fertile offspring. That is, they would have diverged, another term that you know, to form two separate species. Now we've got this other form of um, change called punctuated equilibrium. Now these are changes that are very uh, relatively quick and followed by long periods of little or no change. And you can see that on that graph there. This view was suggested late in the 20th century and argued that speciation ha happened quickly, often in response to a major environmental change. Major environmental change could be a volcanic eruption, a meteor impact, major climate change like the beginning or the end of an ice age. In response, some species are destroyed and others adapt to their new surroundings, exploiting niches left vacant by those species becoming extinct. For example, dinosaurs become extinct 65 million years ago and mammals then taking over the habitats 
abandoned by the dinosaurs. Okay, so you can see there our punctuated equilibrium compared to gradualism. So you can see the difference in um, the change time as such. Gradual, quick change. Okay, the same there, just different types of graphs that you may see. Okay, now we look at an application for speciation. So speciation in the genus Allium by Polyploidae. Now, these Allium are a beautiful range of flowers. They're not just flowers. We'll look into them further soon. They're plants. Put it plants. This all links in with your nature of science, okay? So in living systems, there are trends, but there are exceptions, Okay, so polyploids are organisms with more than two sets of chromosomes. This can happen when the process of meiosis, meiosis fails to separate the chromosomes, the product being a diploid gamete or by hybridization between closely related species. Polyploidy organisms can speciate sympatric, sympatrically. They develop as distinct species in, a, in the same area because their haploid number of chromosomes in the gamete is different from the parent species. Therefore, they cannot interbreed. Okay, so looking a bit further at polyploidy. Polyploidy can be caused by the total non-disjunction of chromosomes during mitosis or meiosis. So we know what non-disjunction is. We looked at that in our core unit. And what we're seeing is we end up with um, triploid or tetraploid outcomes rather than haploid and diploid. If the chromosomes have replicated and the sister chromatid did not separate, this can lead to polyploidy. We looked at these full steps um, when we was looking at disjunction in your core units. Basically, polyploidy is more that is more than the normal set of chromosomes. This situation can lead to our triploid or tetraploid organisms. Once an organism has become a polyploid, it will automatically lead to isolation from the original species. Mating between a tetraploid and a normal diploid organism causes the offspring to be triploid and, sorry, triploid. Unless the organism mates with another triploid individual, the result of the offspring will be sterile. Therefore, the barrier between these individuals will ultimately lead to speciation. Alrighty, what's this got to do with our alliums? So these are plants. I like the, the flowers they give are beautiful, but these are plants such as our garlics, onions and leeks. Okay, so in the allium, asexual reproduction is common. The failure of chromosomes to separate during mitosis has led to in many instances to the doubling of numbers in chromosomes for example from 2n to 4n examples are allium canadense which is 2 with 2n is 14 sorry so what is 2n its diploid number is 14 and alladen candice lavendule with its diploid number as 28 so have a look here, we've got them both. So lavendule is the purple colour. There you go, you've got lavendule being the purple one. Some other examples of polyploids for you, the Ugandan clawed frog with 12 sets of chromosomes. And there's two wild species of banana form the triploid varieties that we now farm. As a tri triploid, they cannot form gametes. Therefore, there's no seeds in the bananas. Okay, the only way they can be um, grown is through propagation by, ve by um, vegetative means or micro propagation. That, guys, is the end of your video on 10.3. Time now to do some practice of that unit.